So what you have is a convicted Nazi collaborator who has been exposed, who did never renounce his politics but continued to organize among fascist, racist, and anti-Semitic circles, who is now a interlocutor for funds heading towards Hungary and Czechoslovakia that are our tax dollars. So we reach into our pocket and pay a convicted Nazi collaborator to build democracy in Hungary. And that gets us to what was really going on with Bill Casey and Oliver North and these people, which is that they think they know better. They think that people who aren't willing to use the tough measures uh, are wimps, essentially, and are going to allow America to fall apart and their patriotism is so jingoistic and so arcane that they think it's perfectly logical to destroy the Constitution in order to save America. There is a pervasive and intense and continuous relationship between the Nazi fascist right wing in the United States and the Republican Party, and even the White House. We'll talk about this right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> civil liberties lawyer told me uh, in Washington, D.C. once that if you don't have civil liberties, you don't have anything. Everything starts from civil liberties. Well, we know, or at least we should know, that there have been continuous attacks on civil liberties of uh, Americans ever since the uh, nation started. And it's gotten worse over the years, as Senate uh, investigations have uh, indicated. We have an expert on this. Chip Burley, who's an investigator and member of the National Lawyers Guild, he's also a writer who's written extensively on civil liberties in the United States and attacks on them, and also into looking into the nature of the fascist and Nazi right-wing uh, elements of our society and how they actually work into the uh, Republican Party and even the White House. So this is going to be a very revealing and interesting program on alternative views. Chip has written uh, uh, articles in the Covert Action Information Bulletin. Matter of fact, we've presented some of these to you. He's also had material printed in the uh, Nation, in the Chicago Sun-Times, and the Boston Globe. Well, you've really done a lot of research on this right-wing uh, fascist Nazi network, which sounds like a strange thing. Why would there be such a thing in the United States? Well, what I've researched is, in fact, that there are separate categories, like you just mentioned, and where they work together. Because there's a difference between a right-winger or a reactionary or a neo-Nazi or a fascist or a religious fundamentalist. Uh, there's a number of different authoritarian-minded sectors in the American body politic. And at various times, they form coalitions and work together uh, in political campaigns around certain social political issues, around legislation. And the question then for me has been to unravel those networks and try and understand why they see a common cause at any different time around a particular issue and why they're willing to work together. Uh, I work for a think tank called Political Research Associates, and um, my background is as a paralegal investigator, which is a fancy term for a snoop. I, I, <laughs> I research files, I uh, talk to people on the phone, and what I try and piece together is the ideology of repression, why repression is seen as a good thing by people on the political right in some cases, and not always. Uh, and there are conservatives who are afraid of the bad aspects of repression and fight it as hard as liberals and progressives and radicals would. Uh, but there is in America a reactionary core of individuals who have been around for a long time and in different historical periods take on different characteristics. And today they are found primarily in what's generally called the new right, uh, as well in the more extreme elements would be found in the neo-Nazi and Ku Klux Klan, Posse Comitatus, and uh, 
Aryan nations crowd, but they're distinct and they're different, and mm -hmm. it's important to make those distinctions to understand the connections. For instance, there's very little connection be directly between groups such as the Ku Klux Klan and uh, Aryan nations directly into Republican Party politics. But there are direct connections, for instance, between actual convicted Nazi collaborators from World War II and the Republican Party. And, and some people couldn't understand why you would have one and not the other, but in fact, that's generally the case. Chip, uh, since uh, World War II, at least one of the common denominators of these right-wing groups has been anti-communism. Yes. That is what justifies the repression of people deemed to be communist or um, um, subversive. Has this been you, the result of your research? Have you found an anti-communist uh, sure. thread running through these different groups? It's, it's an anti-communist thread that's very consistent. Uh, consistent actually all the way back to the Bolshevik Revolution and the fear of radicalism and if you look historically like at the Palmer raids uh, and then again at the Red Scare of the 50s and then again at the political repression that the FBI launched under the COINTELPRO program you see the fear of radicalism and of Bolshevism time and time again being articulated but I think it's important to understand that it's not a fear of real radicalism or real communism or real socialism or real subversion it's it's what Frank Donner in uh, the age of surveillance calls a Manichaean construct it's it's a paranoid hyperbolic fear of what is perceived to be communist and if you look at how the radical right in America describes communism you come to understand that they're really not talking about communism as it exists in any social system right. geographically around the world but this hyperbolic and paranoid subversive red network which is actually the name of course of one of the red baiting publications or red channels or you know uh, the Birch Society is famous for putting out its uh, publications about this n this complex network of subversion and so it's important to understand that it's not real communism that's the fear. It's a perception of what is believed to be communism. Absolutely. And why that's important is as you see the, some of the authoritarian style Leninist regimes collapse, uh, some of the excuse for fighting communism obviously collapses with it. And yet you don't see any diminution of, of repressive forces. What real communism was never the issue. It was the perception. So with the decline of real communism as we know it in geographic terms, they're simply going to shift to new scapegoats. And that's the, obviously we can see that happening all, already with the drug war and, te and terrorism used as a rubric, uh, but also uh, other avenues. Uh, there's an increase, for instance, in the fear of what's called Satanism. Uh, which is, uh, there's always these things are based on one little shred of reality. There are satanic cults in the world. Uh, however, a, every time you see a dead animal on the road, it's not the victim of a satanic, you know, disembowelment. And yet there are people who put out whole studies on the spread of satanic culture through American high schools, where there is no such thing. But you can perceive the hyperbolic reality and react to it as if it were real. So you're going to see the problem of, uh, people are going to be surprised, and they shouldn't be, when, when real communism around the world changes its character, the repressive rep apparatus isn't going to miss a step. It's just going to come up with new, new enemies, new enemies right. to, because it never really was focused on real communism as an issue. But well, uh, part of a lot, lot of it's used on social control to keep down, sure. as an excuse to keep down any change right. against the existing order. Right. Uh, let's be specific now and talk about some of the people and the organizations. Sure and the radical right. And we'll forget about the you know, right-wing fringes, the, the uh, Klan and the Aryan nations mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, white uh, uh, the war. Yeah, white Aryan resistance. Yeah, white Aryan resistance. That's good. Because they're not directly plugged in in high political places or in the t attached to the no. intel they inter they intelligence inter services right. like these other groups. They're some more important. Because can you tell us about some of those? Well, I would point out that people like Tom Metzger and, and Pastor Bob Miles and Pastor... Uh, Butler and others, they interact with a, a, mood, a mood that's set by electoral politicians. Well, Ku Klux Klan members sure. that reach the electoral Sure, realm. and that they, they feed off of each other, and, and, right. and that's important to understand. But there's not as direct a connection as there is with, with elements of the radical right. Uh, w one of uh, the authors who works with us is Russ Ballant of Detroit, right. and he's written several studies of this network. Um, and it sounds pretty crazy to stand up and say that you know that the Republican Party for 20 years has worked with Nazi collaborators and people who agree with that form of political viewpoint. Uh, there are whole books written about how after World War II, 
the OSS uh, directly recruited the Galen spy network of the Nazi apparatus in the East uh, to help set up the CIA. That's not a disputed matter of history. Galen himself wrote about it. It's been written about in very, very mainstream texts. Uh, in fact, I did some primary research on this. I did a book on Herbert Marcuse, who was in charge of the uh, Central Europe Bureau mm -hmm. of the State Department. And after the war, he was seeing the resurrection of neo-Nazi yes. groups. And he did a research report on this Galen mm -hmm. uh, thing. There was all kinds, not just the Galen ring, all kinds of Nazi right. rings were recruited for U.S. Uh, government uh, purposes. Right. Many were allowed passage to the U.S. or Latin America, et cetera. So this has been absolutely documented. And what's interesting is that how that passage occurred through refugee committees in many cases, and that a lot of these people who weren't directly affiliated with the German Nazi apparatus were affiliated with Nazi-supporting Eastern European countries' uh, political systems that were pro-Nazi at the time, partly because they wanted to have their own national status, but partly because they believed it. And it's interesting to watch now in Eastern Europe some of the people who many years ago who are now in their 70s who were brought over as part of this anti-communist network that was going to retake Eastern Europe, the captive nation so-called, are now involved in actually uh, helping provide funding for so-called democratic forces in emerging democratic Eastern Europe. And in fact, what these are are neo-fascist, neo-Nazi or old fascist, old Nazi networks that supported a very feudal authoritarian political structure for the Ukraine, for Romania, for Latvia, for Lithuania, for Estonia, for many of these countries. And the, the tragic joke is that the individuals who were involved in the Holocaust directly and in supporting Nazi ideology now are uh, considered freedom fighters and pro-democratic advisors in these very same countries. Uh, where they, their hands were bloodied 40 years ago. Okay, now who are some of the people and who are some of the organizations? Well, to name one person right out is my, my favorite convicted Nazi collaborator active in the Republican Party is Mr. Laszlo Pastor, who I've, I've interviewed a number of times and who lies to me every time I interview him. <laughs> uh, and I, I say that because I've talked to him and each time I go back after hearing his excuses to the Library of Congress primarily and I research what he says and they're just outright lies. And that's a very well-worn technique with Nazis is the big lie. Uh, he was a Hungarian, right? He is a Hungarian national who was an active member of the Hungarian Arrow Cross, which was recently popularized in the movie Music Box. Uh, it was a pro-Nazi, anti-Semitic, fascist organization that wanted to racially purify Hungary. He claims that he was forced to join the youth group. Uh, we discovered that he was, in fact, appointed the director of the youth group. Uh, each time you confront him, he falls back on a new position of lying. Finally, Professor Randolph Bram uh, of New York went and obtained his actual Hungarian conviction record and translated it so that we could for, for finally put to an end his denials. Uh, he was convicted of being a Nazi collaborator by a Hungarian court prior to the communists taking over, if that matters to someone. Uh, he always said that the communists jailed him, and he was a freedom fighter. In fact, while Hungary was a multi-party state in the uh, mid-40s, uh, he was convicted by his fellow countrymen in a pluralistic and open society and did time. Uh, he was, in fact, released under a communist government who felt that he had served enough time uh, that he had been sentenced for under the previous government. Uh, how, did he, how did he get over here? And, uh, what is it's he a little murky how he exactly got over here. He was freed in Hungary in the late 40s. Sometime in the early 50s he shows up in the United States and begins to immediately organize Republican Party ethnic Hungarian units and then he claims quite directly, and there's no reason to doubt him, that he worked out a deal with Richard Nixon that, uh, that he would be part of a permanent ethnic outreach apparatus of the Republican Party. Uh, that, in fact, happened. Uh, George Bush, when he was head of the Republican Party, reviewed Laszlo Pastor's yearly plan for that organization called the Republican Heritage Groups Council and signed off on it and made recommendations. And yet, when it was exposed that Oslo Pastor was actively working in his campaign, he denied any knowledge of Mr. Pastor, even though he had previously approved his work plan for the year. How did it come out that he had this Nazi past? Well, actually, it came out because a group of uh, Hungarian Republicans who were not Nazis and not fascists were appalled that he, had, he was the person that they had to go to to work with the Republican Party. And, and 
you know, they said things like, well, we're conservative, but he's a Nazi, you know, they didn't want to work with him. Uh, and so they exposed him to Jack Anderson many years ago, uh, and uh, he has been exposed repeatedly over the years, and he just never goes away. He just keeps coming back. Well, he's just one of many they have. He's just one of many. He's Bulgarian, a good example. Be a Bulgarian is on the same organization with the same type of past, yes. or Romanian and whatever. There's you're a number saying. of Eastern European ethnics that Pastor was responsible for bringing into the Republican Party. What's important to understand that not all all nationalists from Eastern Europe supported fascist politics, right. and not all people from those ethnic groups support these uh, fascist tendencies. What it has happened, however, is the Republican Party has allowed these fascists and anti-Semites and racists to be their connection to these uh, ethnic communities. Let's, but this let's is follow Pastor through to the end because he played a big role in George Bush's campaign yes. and is now playing a role in contact with Hungarian groups in right. Hungary that the U.S. is giving big bucks to yeah. to try to quote unquote promote democracy. democracy and the question is are these fascist groups. So let's go into the election first. He was a member of Bush's 1988 yes. Ethnic Heritage uh, Outreach Program. Right. Coalition of American Nationalities it was called. There's this permanent structure called the Republican Heritage Groups Council and that exists now continuously throughout and every four years they spin off essentially a campaign arm for tax and political purposes and and Pastor was involved in that along with a number of the other people from the Heritage Groups Council uh, we along with Washington Jewish Week exposed once again this reality um, and the Bush campaign simply lied they simply said that everyone uh, first of all it wasn't true and anyway they'd all resigned well, it was true, and we, we defy them to find a single error of fact in our report. And uh, in fact, when the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Boston Globe called these people and asked if they had resigned, they all said no. They all said they'd never been contacted. So the media just rolled over and played dead on that whole question. And as soon as the campaign was over, these people began to be brought back into administrative kind of positions uh, within the Republican Party and within the Bush administration. Then we find the National Endowment for Democracy in funding Hungarian and Czechoslovak groups has been giving money to its, I'll use the real term, front groups that it's created uh, to carry on counterinsurgency. And that who does the translations for these requests from the Hungarian groups, but one, Laszlo Pastor, who also makes recommendations as to which groups should get the funding. So what you have is a convicted Nazi collaborator who has been exposed who did never renounce this politics but continued to organize among fascist, racist, and anti-Semitic circles, who is now a interlocutor for funds heading towards Hungary and Czechoslovakia that are our tax dollars. So we reach into our pocket and pay a convicted Nazi collaborator to build democracy in Hungary. I mean, I think there's something wrong there. I now Maybe this, it's just me. You know. This National Endowment for Democracy, uh, you remember we told you uh, in our background story on the uh, Nicaraguan elections, it was the National uh, Endowment for Democracy that organized and uh, financed the UNO opposition of the Sandinistas. So they do this all over the world, sure. and it's government money, it's tax money going to this organization. And then, like you said in your uh, Nation article, the National Endowment for, the, uh, for Democracy gave $400,000 to your buddy here. Pat well, they Starr. gave $400,000 yeah. to Hungary, of which at least some portion was uh, channeled, channeled by, by him sure. through his recommendations. And there are other organizations many <laughs> which uh, get money and these people uh, uh, are are involved in so it's a whole network it just didn't one just the organization itself which is a kind of a tail out to the republican party they right. get involved with a lot of foreign policy overt and covert and they have connections with the intelligence services sure right? but this is all predicated on, on a decision that was made after world war ii which is that if you have to choose between working with a fascist <coughs> or working with a communist in a particular country for a foreign policy reason you always choose the fascist if they're anti-communist as long as they're anti-communist right and to show you how this is still working here's a may 9th edition of the guardian and it says there's a new coalition called the national Com uh, council to support the democracy movements in the ussr and uh, lo and behold who's involved you, you've read about uh, yeah. this i guess and uh, the, the uh, f they funnel money to uh, the people who are uh, against 
the whom you know the the, the conservative the, the capitalist right. types in the Soviet Union they want to support again, sure. but the, also uh, the material and political functions for the National Council will be says uh, set up in a and worked out in a conference in Prague hosted by Czechoslovak President Havel. Right, and many of the people <laughs> involved in this uh, are part of the new right, and it's important to understand that uh, Laszlo Pastor himself works in offices provided for him by Paul Weyrich of the Free Congress Foundation. And the Free Congress Foundation itself is merely one of a triad of important groups in the political reactionary right. There's the Free Congress Foundation, which really is the, the, uh, the Christian equivalent of Islamic fundamentalism in this country. They, they network ultra-right-wing Christian fundamentalists. Uh, there's the Heritage Foundation, which is really uh, the legislative kind of uh, research think tank that justifies anything that uh, is uh, laissez-faire capitalism. And then there's a much more secretive group called the Council for National Policy, which is where these people get together and meet in secret. And uh, this is a group, when you call them and ask if they've had their annual meeting, they will not even admit that they have meetings, much less whether or not their annual one has occurred. Sound like the right-wing Bilderberg. Uh, well, they are, in fact, are exactly that. They were set up to be a counterweight to the Bilderberg or trilateralist um, Council on Foreign Relations uh, kind of worldview. Are there establishment um, politicians that are a part of this, or is this more these right-wing fringe groups that just develop position papers or strategies? Well, this is, in fact, a place where these both of those forces get together. You have yeah. former Ku Klux Klan leaders in this. Mm -hmm. You have religious fundamentalists. You have segregationists. You also have elected government officials. Uh, and uh, you have people like Ali North who gets invited to join after he's exposed, but who worked with many of these people along the way, and people like General Singlob gives addresses. So this is sort of like a nexus of reactionary thought in the U.S. And again, I mean, I don't think that the Bilderbergers or the Trilateralists or the Council on Foreign Relations is some kind of arcane conspiracy. It's people who have money and power trying to perpetuate that. And they're doing it. And they've quite, done a very, done a very, very good job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what you have here is the reactionary right saying, well, you know, we need to do the same thing. And these people network pretty well. We need to network each other. And so you have this triad of groups. And inside this triad of groups is the ideological base for some of these phenomena like a, a convicted Nazi collaborator being pro-democracy groups like the World Anti-Communist League. This yes, is where this of core of people is involved in the World Anti-Communist League. And uh, which for a time the, the uh, international director of was General Singlob, and it's, it's a hat that gets passed around. He's still active in it. But this uh, has some of the most notorious uh, uh, ex Nazis and ex fascists yeah. and uh, death squad leaders right. in the world. As a matter of right. fact, some of the right wingers were uh, bailing out of the World Anti Communist League because they said it was too violent. <laughs> and they well, in fact, uh, one of the funniest memos I've ever seen of the World Anti Communist League is from a very right wing. A British group that said we're very conservative but these people are Nazis and we will not be part of it and uh, they uh, also there are several other studies done by European former members who just said you know we know the difference between being a political conservative and being an outright Nazi and these people are outright Nazis they want a fascist authoritarian form of government uh, to fight communism because it's efficient and it's true I mean you know fascism is a very efficient form and if that's that these people think that it's perfectly legitimate to give up civil liberties to stop their perception of what they see as communism. It's I, yeah. I think it's ironic that the World Anti-Communist League and a lot of other organizations which work in conjunction with the Israeli secret police, the Mossad, I was reading an article where somebody was saying, hey, how come you uh, uh, anti-Semites work with these Israelis? They say, well, they're good Jews. <laughs> well, you have to be careful here because there's such a history of anti-Semitism in the world and in the country that you, you have to pick your terms carefully. The great tragedy, I think, is that groups like the Anti-Defamation League, which could expose people like Laszlo Pastor and could expose the fascist, anti-Semitic character of many of the members of the World Anti-Communist League, choose not to. And I really think that that's a, that's a shame because uh, you would think that they would be in the forefront of exposing these people, and they're not. They have a double standard, actually. In the uh, ADL, they have one standard for black Democrats and another standard for white Republicans. So what I think the point is to be careful to understand that coalitions are formed for political expediency. And the same people who would put Jews to death in the Holocaust will work with reactionary Jews to fight communism. Mm. And that may be, I think, I think it's a pretty dumb coalition because, you know, if, as soon as they liquidate communism, I, I'm pretty sure they would turn around and liquidate their current allies. So it's a very short sighted 
two-sided coalition. Right, let's focus on the World Anti-Communist League and the Reagan administration. They came to some prominence in the media yeah. during this administration when Singlaub and others in this group came to support the uh, Contras. How did this uh, happen, and is this sort of typical of how some of these right-wing groups are able to penetrate the U.S. government and become part of foreign policy adventures? Well, I don't think it's a question of penetration mm -hmm. as much as it, they're part of the political coalition these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go back to the McCarthy period to understand that there has always been uh, a nativist core that has gotten elected to Congress and that has some role in Republican Party politics primarily. Uh, and nativism is a political movement of the 1800s, which was xenophobic. It feared foreigners, feared immigrants, thought that, the, that they had an idealized view of the American way of life. And this kind of theory today has led to the kind of phobia about perceived subversion and communism. And that's the roots of it are in the nativist movement. So these reactionary nativist circles are there. Uh, in the Reagan administration, they helped elect Reagan through the new right and the religious right and some of the stop the sale of the Panama Canal single issue groups brought real reactionary mentality people into the government uh, as a very normal process of paying them back for their electoral support. Right. The, I think the best example to understand how this functions is to see how George Shultz fared during the early stages of the Iran-Contra affair. George Shultz is a political conservative. Uh, he's not my hero as a politician, but he came under constant attack by the more reactionary circles because he had some allegiance to the Constitution, and they did not. <laughs> but that's really what came down, is yeah. that the more reactionary circles in the, in the White House and in the executive branch and in Congress um, didn't like George Shultz because he was continually holding up the yardstick of the Constitution and saying, we can't really step over this line. And that gets us to what was really going on with Bill Casey and Oliver North and these people which is that they think they know better. They think that people who aren't willing to use the tough measures uh, are wimps, essentially, and are going to allow America to fall apart. And their patriotism is so jingoistic and so arcane that they think it's perfectly logical to destroy the Constitution in order to save America. Uh, because what they see as the Constitution and what they see as America are two different things. Uh, I don't. I mean, I think, the, I think our society is based on a constitution, and that's the document that holds us together. They see an idealized, romanticized, primarily male, white, agrarian society uh, that they long for, and that's what they're trying to reconstruct in their own mind when they violate the constitution and as how, they do. And how did Singlaub and his World Anti-Communist League get into the Reagan administration and work with them on this Contra project? Primarily because of the same mechanism that brought in the, the, the Nazi forces after World War II is that you have this sort of unholy alliance of political fascism, industrial right-wing money, and government anti-communist structures that developed this theory of the permanent war with communism. And you see the theoretical writings of this in the early 50s with the work of, of William Kintner, who actually wrote a book called The Front is Everywhere, uh, and the work of Strauss Huppé and others of the Foreign Policy Research Institute at the University of Pennsylvania and some work done at the Hoover Institute, where people lay out the idea that we are in a struggle to death with political communism, which in this country manifests itself through subversion through social change groups. And they actually develop a theory of both foreign policy and domestic repression, which sees an unending struggle of peeling back these layers till you find the Bolshevik core. And it's this mentality that is useful if you're doing a counterinsurgency program in Vietnam uh, or in Thailand or Cambodia or in the Philippines or in Central America or Africa. And so you have this alliance of forces. Sometimes they operate with the tacit approval of the government. Sometimes they operate with the complete approval of the government. Sometimes they sort of do their own thing and the government looks the other way. Uh, and it's sort of a, it's a loosely structured network, but it's one that has some very serious agreements around what needs to be done and the necessity of uh, breaking a few eggs to make the omelet. I saw an article in Covert Action Information Bulletin which laid out the relationships of the religious fundamentalist right wing with this uh, right wing network which we're talking about. And these religious fundamentalist leaders
are intertwined uh, with these various organizations, mm -hmm. you know, the Pat Robertson group, <coughs> uh, uh, the uh, Mooney groups, CAUSA, yeah. or CAUSA, however they pronounce CAUSA. it. CAUSA, okay. They are members of the World Anti-Communist League. They help in uh, providing funds for the Contras. They're in a lot of these organizations. Yep. Now, is this, are they closely allied or are they intermixed completely or uh, they just work together for the same cause? All of the above. I mean, it really depends on the issue, the specific issue and the specific time period because they have fights too. I mean, there's falling out. Uh, it's important to understand where the new right comes from because the new right has become a major player in Republican Party politics and in governing our country. They're a factor that has to be dealt a card at the table. You know, when you sit down and you divide up, they got to get, get something. They got to get a slice of the pie. And my premise has always been over the last 10 years is that why do we use the most reactionary and violent counterinsurgency methods in Central America? And the answer is simply is because there's no market there. And so if you're going to have to give a slice of the pie to some wacko right-wing reactionary, you might as well give them a country that has no economy. Because the same Reagan administration that swore to, that to defend to the death the, 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 the barrier against communism in Nicaragua was opening up trade deals in Russia and China. Then why was that allowed to happen? And the answer is, is that you have to give them something. And you can give them undeveloped countries that don't have real markets that are definable to screw around with and destroy. And then they're happy. And meanwhile, the big boys get to you know, make billions uh, selling Coke and McDonald's hamburgers. So the new right becomes a player, and they did it very cleverly by coming up with vertical sectors to organize. Uh, they came up with knitting together industrialists, investors and bankers, people worried about the collapse of morality and Christianity, people worried about communism, people worried about this, that, and the other thing. All these single issue sectors were put together with industrialists and investment banking community and presented a package that they could all generally agree on, even though some of it's mutually inconsistent, like trade with Russia while stopping communism in Nicaragua, which is less communist than Russia was at the time. So clearly this was a, this was a brilliant maneuver and it lasted for quite a while. It came out, however, of a political organization that was put together by a handful of people who really came out of the segregationist forces in the United States and really defined a classic reactionary model. And there were people like Howard Phillips, uh, Richard Vigory, the direct mail wizard, Paul Weirich of the Free Congress Foundation. Weirich, who has always been uh, uh, the emissary of the Coors family money in Washington. And they approached Jerry Falwell to create moral majority. And it's important to understand that this was created by a group of people with reactionary segregation policies. As a policies, political project as a political not a moral project. or religious right. project. That's right. You've always had religious fundamentalism in this country and it very often has not been allied with political reaction. It's been right. conservative, but it's not by all any means been traditionally reactionary or pro-fascist. Um, then you have money pouring in from industrialists uh, such as Smith Richardson, Owen Foundation, the Coors family, Milliken, fabrics, you know, the Visa fabrics, the people who make that, they buy full page ad in John Birch Society publications. Uh, the Loctite Corporation found, uh, former director of that is uh, Mr. Kreeble. Uh, Richard Mellon Scaife of the M Mellon Family Fortune. All of these old money industrial groups and some of the new money investment, you know, the Yankees and the Cowboys got together on this and they funded this entity, which was a reactionary entity. And it grew and it staked out a vote that it could control and it then went to the Republican Party and said you got to deal us in and they did and that's how this came about and they gave them the Contra war as their son absolutely they couldn't give them abortion because they tried and failed right. and they tried uh, prayer in school and failed yeah. but they could give something and it happened unfortunately to be Central America and parts of Africa mm. uh, and it's tragic mm -hmm. there's another stratum of uh, US government that gets involved interlaced all throughout these various organizations are direct and indirect connections with the US intelligence services particularly the CIA can you tell us about that well, that's, that's a much larger area, but there's no doubt that it's true. And it, again, it, it goes back to that classic uh, deal with the devil, I call it, when we decided to bring over uh, the, uh, the Galen network after World War II. There is clearly a shared interest in both religious fundamentalism that is reactionary in character, in terms of anti-communism, the hyperbolic form, in terms of a number of these different entities, in terms of the government uh, counterinsurgency arm wanting to defend it, 
America, its view of America from its perceived enemy. Because the religious people don't like communism because it's godless. Uh, the uh, anti-communists don't like communism because they're phobic about it. And uh, the more mainstream political forces in the government don't like communism because it restricts markets. And they're, the Kissingers of the world are pragmatically, uh, you know, uh, pragmatically and programmatically against communism because it, it defines markets that aren't penetrable by U.S. investment. So you have suddenly a group of people, all of whom find a common purpose in working together. And so they do. And you know, I don't know how many people grew up reading the books by Tom Dooley about his missions in China and all of this stuff. But yeah. I certainly did. I didn't read them. Uh, but you remember, you're always hearing he about these saint back then. These, <laughs> the, these saint-like people who set up these Christian missions all over the world. And if you go back now and look through the files and through the documents and through uh, some of the material that has come out, in fact, many of these people were sent there as if not originally part of, they were they were adopted into counterinsurgency efforts all over the world. CIA and, uh, operations. CIA operations, uh, which continue today through a variety of religious front groups whose main goal may be on paper to help refugees and to help the poor, but who are in fact part of counterinsurgency operations. A classic example is a group called the Christian Anti-Communism Crusade, which does revivals in the Philippines, revivalist meetings, where they bring people back to Christ. And General Ramos of the Philippines is an active, an ardent supporter of, of this. And Dr. Fred Schwartz is the guy who runs the Christian Anti-Communism Crusade. And John Whitehall is one of his chief field workers. And when you go and see the materials that are handed out, these are manuals and cartoon books and documents talking about stopping the spread of communism at its source, which is liberalism. Political liberalism is defined as where the slippery slope starts down towards communism. Well, you know, that's pretty scary stuff to start talking about how you have to fight political liberalism and secular humanism is another code word because it inevitably leads towards barbaric terrorist communism. And that's actually the images they use in the Philippines. But it produces death squads. It produces death squads, that's right. It, it motivates these that's people right. and guides them to kill right. supposed that's communist right. subversives. Didn't this that's group right. take hold in Guatemala? Rios Montt Rios was, Mont was, was yes. a fundamentalist exactly. uh, Similar convert to right. this kind of religious yes. line. And he was ruthless sure. in his use of death squads and pacification camps to exterminate. Sure, because you had uh, not only political expediency solution. and economic pragmatism, but you had the zealotry of a religious crusade. Right. And that's what's the most scary part of this kind of reactionary-minded thinking that adds on a religious element. You have to understand, the na people in this country cannot define fascism and they cannot define Nazism. They have a cartoon book concept of what these are. If you believe that fascism and Nazism existed during World War II and when Hitler died it was all over, it's because no one's taught you what political fascism was as a movement based on nationalism. Uh, and no one taught you that Nazism was political nationalistic fascism with a race conscious theory applied over it. And that these are theories that anybody can have. That they're not German, they're not Italian. Uh, you can understand the kind of reactionary move in Israel much more clearly if you understand that it has nothing to do with who you are or where you come from, but it's how you see the world it's and an how you think. It's an authoritarian mentality, an authoritarian mentality. mentality that sees mm -hmm. enemies as absolutely evil right. and a threat and sees yourself as absolutely good and And with pure. an historic mission. Right. And the, your enemy is so violent, so vicious, so evil that you have to exterminate them. And you can and use anything any Anything you do is justified. Right. They believe in an authoritarian structure of society in which the government has a right to intervene not only in economic relationships but in private personal and uh, religious relationships that believes in a historical destiny for the nation that it's involved in that believes that uh, a strong leader who exerts his will primarily uh, deserves unquestioning support to fulfill that historic mission that sees the role of the worker is to be a good worker and help build the society and not demand too much from the industrial side, sees the industrialist role as working in a partnership with the government to move the nation forward with the quiescence and, and support of the workforce, uh, sees morality in very narrow terms that are defined uh, to support a male uh, 
primarily male, primarily white, primarily heter uh, exclusively heterosexual, except in the case of the Strasser faction, and they were dealt with in the Night of the Long Knives. And essentially, a rigid view of dominance as being justified by God. Uh, if you're powerful enough to seize power, then by God you should run the country as you see fit. It leads to violence because if your destiny yes. is to expand right. your power and influence and any means necessary are legitimate, you're going to have to use violence in some situations. Violence externally as well as internally. And right, as well as uh, suppressing yeah. the you enemies must at home the or threatening home. this uh, fascist project. Because if you're, you're standing in the way of destiny, therefore any means that are required to quiet dissent or justified and since your destiny is global you then treat borders as a merely a temporal impediment to your growth historically I, let me oh, just add that Nazism adds to that racial destiny mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to understand that Nazism as, a, as an ism doesn't think of particularly one group as less important as much as it thinks of itself as more important. It's important to understand also that when Mussolini was asked to define fascism, he said, first and foremost, you must understand that fascism is reactionary. Reactionary, though, is another term that's, that's loose. People don't understand what reactionary means. Reactionary politics, fascist politics, or proto-fascist politics that's reactionary, comes from a political movement against modernity which was the political theory of our revolution and the French Revolution expounded by Rousseau. And what were these theories? That people were, it was good to be equal before the law, equality. Not that everyone was the same, but you stood equal before the law. Uh, you know, uh, there's equality, I'm going to get this one, there's fraternity, and what was the third Liberty, one? liberty. civil liberties. Civil liberty, liberty from oppressive government, right. though they meant. They didn't just mean civil liberties as we know them, but the right of people to petition for change in right. government and not to be oppressed by an overarching government that intruded itself into your daily life. That's what they meant by liberty. And fraternity in the sense that everyone shared a spark of humanity that should be defended, which flies in the face of the idea that your, your enemy is evil and it should be exterminated. So reactionary politics, which are now dealt a card at the table of the Republican Party, includes that force which does not believe we are all equal before the law, that does not believe that the government should keep its nose out of everyone's business and not be oppressive and believes that certain people don't deserve to live and that's a scary thought but they actually that's their political basis of ideology they also don't believe in liberties or rule by law this is that's another right. function of the modern state to establish rule by law right. and it's precisely these rules by law that fascists and these reactionary groups oppose because they think this is an abstract liberalism yeah. and that there's higher moral purposes right. than mere positive law and so that's why fascists easily broke the law to beat up on Jews and then eventually to exterminate them because they didn't believe well, actually, in rule by law and these groups also in the US really are lawless. What they actually did, uh, uh, it's interesting to note that first they passed laws hmm. uh, to allow uh, for confiscation. So they did two things at the same time. First they allowed the brown shirts to break the law. Right. And they simply let them beat people up crystal knocked and in some of the street fighting. And then when some people re rejected that ham-handed brown shirtism, they simply passed laws right. to make the state do it. So it's important to understand it's a one-two punch. Right. You know, in one hand, the private right wing goes out and does it, and if that isn't working popularly enough, then the state will come in and do it, and that they, they trade positions and power back and forth in that way, which is a very normal way of a political process of functioning, but it how, happens. How many people and how many organizations are we talking about now? In the, in the United right wing in the this United sort States. of fascist authoritarian stripe? Well, I, there are probably 200 organizations that we follow at Political Research Associates. Um, and in those groups, it's difficult to say what they're following is because they are higher, not surprisingly given their authoritarian bent, they're hierarchical. They're, they're organized from the top down. There's not a real grassroots movement across the board for this. And they're interlocks. And they're interlocks. There's tremendous board overlapping of the course funded groups, for instance. Um, so I, I'd be hard-pressed to say a, a fixed number. I mean, there's probably fewer than uh, 100,000 activists in this field, but they probably reach 10 to 20 million Americans on some level on a weekly basis through TV, radio, newspapers, uh, and whether or not people buy the whole package, 
that they, they are motivated politically and religiously by, by these forces. And how strong are they under Bush? We've noted that under Reagan they played a leading role yeah. in many projects in his administration. Have they been shunted to the sideline by the Bush administration or are they still players? Well, this is the one-two punch. They're still players, mm -hmm. but they have lost power. And in fact, there's a split within these groups. The people like Richard Vigory and Howard Phillips called Reagan a uh, useful idiot for even negotiating with Gorbachev. So that to a certain extent, the most extreme reactionary elements have been broken away from the, the uh, more mainstream of their institutionalized reality. So that you have the Heritage Foundation people being a little more closer to reality in, in Washington than the Vigory Phillips people. But they, even within that construct, they don't have the power they did under Reagan. They've lost power. And uh, you see them trying to regain the direction that they had when they built this coalition. The coalition that put Reagan into office no longer exists on the political right in this country. But you can't dismiss it as having power. It's just it's fractured right now, and it's looking around for some new, some new way of mobilizing its forces. Um, and the, I think you see that, especially like with the abortion uh, fanatics uh, who are, are, have sensed that they've reached a plateau in terms of people uh, supporting them and are turning to more and more extreme tactics. So you have to be careful that sometimes isolation breeds a kind of resistance and uh, fight back that, that's very dangerous. You also see, however, that the classic, you know, this private sector gets pushed back. Bush, the former director of the CIA, has simply institutionalized bipartisan counterinsurgency as the dominant American foreign policy. It certainly was strong under Reagan, but what Reagan couldn't do, Bush has achieved because Reagan's jingoism was just a little too extreme. Congress really didn't tolerate some of his more adventurous policies. That Bush uses the intelligence yes. apparatus and, and uh, counterinsurgency and actually intervention like the Panama invasion, yes. more, effectively Much more effectively than Reagan. So he doesn't need to go outside yes. of established foreign policy intelligence right. circles he knows that to in Washington, do these things. Yeah. Whereas Reagan was forced to bring in some of these real extremists from the right simply because he couldn't get Congress, couldn't get Congress to, to go, go along, along with some of these uh, policies on the record. Right. But the extremists still are working in conjunction with, with, Bush. with Bush. Oh, yes, like very much Hungarian so. Like Hungarian guy, sure. Laszlo, mm -hmm. who's getting funds mm -hmm. for uh, Hungarian groups. Sure. How, how do you sure. see this in a historical perspective now? We've been talking about the Republicans, and uh, this implies that if the Democrats were in, this would no longer be the case. But we've seen the Democrats, well, that Democrats true, right? have used uh, repression. I mean, as the Democrats carried on the Vietnam War uh, most of the years. Uh, we've seen uh, the FBI flourish under the Democrats. Yeah. But where, if the Democrats got elected, where would this right-wing uh, network go? Well, they do what they always do when Democrats gain electoral power, which is that they fade back into think tanks and road shows and uh, lectures at uh, uh, American Legion halls and uh, begin writing more vociferously in Reader's Digest. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you want to get a sense of where the, the nexus with mainstream America is of this reactionary re reality is go to your public library and pick out articles in Reader's Digest that talk about communism and liberalism and, you know, uh, teenage pregnancy. And uh, it's a very reactionary kind of uh, worldview that's presented by them. Uh, but you also see them moving into uh, popular organizations now. For instance, the coalition that's put together by Robert Grant of Christian Voice and, and the Moon Network, American Freedom Coalition, which puts out American Freedom Journal, which has offices in every state in the United States and does work in every state legislature. And you see them building, trying to build a grassroots movement now that will get the kind of voting power that they, they welded together when they first put together the new right back in the, in the late 70s. So I think you have to look carefully at groups like the American Freedom Coalition and the Moonies, which are kind of a theocratic fascist movement. And it really drives me wild when uh, people who want to defend Moon's civil liberties, and I agree his civil liberties are as valuable as everyone else's, uh, but if you defend his civil liberties, I think it's important to call him what he is. He's a fascist. He is a classic theocratic fascist, and any textbook definition will suffice if you look at what he says and what he does. And I, I am very upset by people who don't use these terms because they're afraid people will misunderstand them.
I went up and saw George Seldes. I go up every year to see oh, him. Yeah. Uh, we man who wrote, with him. A uh, man who's written uh, 30 books on political fascism and repression and, and authoritarianism. And uh, he just shakes his head because he looks at people like Lyndon LaRouche and, and Moon and some of these other groups and say, well, how can you not call them fascist given their economic and political views? It's just there for anyone to see. And the answer is, is because we don't teach that fascism and authoritarianism and political reaction are ideologies that exist anymore. Uh, there's communism and there's democracy, and that's it in the world, right? What, how do you put this, uh, these organizations and groups, people we've been talking about in historical perspective in well, the U.S.? Well, the seeds for this kind of, again, nativist, reactionary, the politics of fear it's sometimes called. It reacts against what's happening with fear and seeks to find scapegoats. The seeds are always there. There always are going to be a handful of people around. Uh, Professor Richard Hofstetter did a classic study called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And what he says is that these people are always there as background noise. And in different periods of America, you've had them gain a mass following. And what he says it's important to look at is why at any given period do these people gain a mass following? And sometimes it's con economic conditions are bad and people are worried. Sometimes their social conditions are bad or there's uh, upheaval in the social construct. Sometimes it has to do with uh, political battles. And I think in the, what we've seen in most recently is, is with the, the rise of the new right, it was a reaction against the 60s. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, flowering, you'll pardon the term, of, of political viewpoints and progressive thinking and challenges to the norm in terms of sexuality and uh, uh, in terms of uh, politics and foreign policy. And it, it galvanized a core group of people who were afraid that America was collapsing. And they first tried, as early as 1964, to throw their weight behind Goldwater. And that really didn't succeed for a couple reasons. One of which Goldwater was never as extreme as they were. You know, he really was more a conservative than a reactionary, and so he never really was comfortable with them, and they were never comfortable with him. Uh, after the Goldwater campaign is when you have Vigory decide he's going to regrow the American reactionary movement without its ties to the old segregationist Birch past, and he, and he does he succeeds. And I think a lot of the people who followed the New Right felt that they didn't know where their place was in the world, where America was place was. America was losing its status as a world power. They were losing their status as the middle class. Uh, their children, they suddenly felt maybe their children wouldn't do as well as they did, where they did as better. Their, their parents' life was to make their life better for them, and they couldn't do that for their own children. And you know, that hurts. Mm -hmm. That really hurts a parent. I'm a parent, and I'm going, you know, I don't think that my son is going to have as good an economic life as I do. And I certainly don't have as good an economic life as my dad raised me under. Uh, so people who are scared like that turn toward easy answers. And that's kind of scapegoating that goes on. And you see that in the rise of homophobia, especially. Uh, and you see that in the rise of anti-Semitism and racism, that people who don't know where their place is in the world want to find an easy scapegoat. And you, that's, I think, what we have seen is the politics of scapegoating. And whether on foreign policy you're scapegoating your perception of communism as an evil or terrorism or now drugs, uh, you know, this whole question of drugs being aimed at the black community when 80% of all drug abuse is in the white community, there's something very sinister going on there. The statistics show very clearly that drug abuse is a widespread problem throughout a society. Um, so it's scapegoating again, and it serves a very authoritarian function. Well, it looks like it might get worse because uh, the economic system is unraveling. Our society seems to be unraveling uh, compared to, uh, like you say, compared to previous generations. So is there a danger of this becoming much worse? Sure. There's always a danger it could get much worse. There's also a possibility that, you know, you see the college kids on campuses today, a lot of them are getting active on a lot of levels. You also see the splitting up of some previous uh, givens. For instance, even among the reactionary right, you have more and more people concerned about environmentalism. And, and that's good. That's very positive. And I think that, that you're going to see environmentalism crossing a lot of these sectors and breaking down a coalition that has existed in the past. And that will, that will help. You also see more and more people coming to grips with women in society. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's better, and people feel better about it. They're less awkward, and there's a tension there that's 
hasn't gone away, but it seems to be resolving. I mean, society seems to now be ready to accept that women deserve equal status. They haven't gotten around to providing it yet. Uh, I would say it's the not as thing is the collapse of the Soviet <coughs> Empire no definitely. longer provides the the yes. sort of real justification for anti-communism. Right. In other words, the Soviet Union was expansionist yeah. for many years. It did pose a threat to U.S. interests in different parts of the world. Geographically, sure. Yeah. And this is no longer the case. Right. So there's not any rational facade for right. anti-communism of the sort that's been the dominant religion right. in this country. And this, I think, is going to hurt those right-wing yeah. groups. I agree. I was going to say that uh, in terms of foreign policy, that clearly is the major thing, uh, historic, mm -hmm. epical kind of right. transition. Well, they'll take us something, like you said. Well, I was going to say, they'll take us oh, something. Drugs yeah. and terrorism. <laughs> Drugs and terrorism will and do. And gays, yeah. they've already begun to... Yeah. Target, so. I think you have to understand the, also that with the attacks, especially there's a, there's a rise in anti-Semitism, but the rise of racism is very troubling because we have yet to set an agenda where we deal with that on a national level, and you really have to understand that that's the most unfinished agenda of all of these uh, issues. That brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We also can provide you with information about how to get some material by John Stockwell. We'd like to thank the people who helped make the program possible. Eric Eubank was our camera person. Kevin L. West was our audio man. Jill Scott helped with the editing. And of course, we want to thank the National Lawyers Guild for arranging for our interview. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So, there's our address. Please write to us. Goodbye.